Welcome one and all uh, for uh, this in conversation with show uh, on this Sunday. I'm extremely happy to host this uh, session week after week with the professionals, experts, entrepreneurs, business tycoons. Um, this uh, uh, session's objective is, as all of us know, uh, it is to empower MSMEs, empower entrepreneurs, industries, and empowering society uh, to give back to society whatever the knowledge skills we develop and we learn from experts speakers in this program that is one of the major objective of this uh, show i am uh, very very delighted to host uh, a very special guest uh, this sunday as well um, as all of us know uh, today's buzzword is about uh, internet digital go digital work from home um, you know all of us are spending a lot of time on laptops and mobile phones and uh, online uh, tools, uh, you know, the online cloud-based applications and uh, so on and so forth, apps and so on and so forth. But when we all uh, start using these applications, we also have to remember that there are a lot of flip and flop side. We use it for our business, for our profession, for our learnings, education, things like that. But at the same time, it has also has its own uh, challenges Sometimes we overlook those challenges. We do not know. Only when we get trapped into the issues, the problems, then we go around and frantically search for help from experts like uh, the cyber crime officers, police officers, or the professionals. So for the benefit of uh, people who are now hooked to the internet and the web all the time, um, see Change Consulting in conversation with series takes a pride and it's a proud privilege to host an expert in the industry for more than 20 years, 25 years, who knows in and out of uh, cyber law and cyber security, data protection, and the whole lot of uh, uh, services pertaining to this industry. Uh, the most important public face of this person is, is a data protection and data governance consultant. The data protection and personal data protection is a new buzzword in the industry itself. One of the objectives of uh, this gentleman is about FDPPI. So what exactly FDPPI? Let's see when we discuss with him. It's going to help industries in a very, very large scale to protect their data. And uh, he's a practitioner for more than 20 years in this cyberspace, internet technologies as a consultant, as a uh, prolific writer, prolific speaker, trainer, consultant, coach for several of the large industries to small industries. So uh, let's welcome uh, the only one expert in this field whom I know for a long time, Mr. Na Vijay Shankar. Welcome you, sir, Mr. Navi. Thank you, Anand. Uh, we are meeting after a very long gap uh, in professional uh, life. Um, so, in fact, very uh, reason of, by reason of uh, contacting you, I have been actually transported into uh, the uh, what, uh, kind of environment I used to be in in the years uh, around 1990s, I think that was the first time I had uh, uh, met you. So it's more than 30 uh, years. Uh, at that time, computers were new, as you are aware. In fact, our interaction was <laughs> when I bought my first computer. <laughs> okay, so um, before uh, I, I, I mean the desktop computer. Prior to that, of course, uh, there were other uh, smaller handheld computer systems which uh, I had dabbled uh, with. But uh, it's good to meet after a long time. Uh, both of Thank us you. Have matured in our uh, professional life and we have a different perspective and I hope we will be able to uh, bring out some of those aspects during this conversation. Uh, of course, I have been uh, a reasonably serious person, in fact, uh, you want it to be very <laughs> casual. Um, yes, by nature, I am a little more uh, a serious person, uh, probably I have uh, uh, lost that uh, early uh, zest uh, of a playful uh, life uh, because uh, I went into a serious career very early in my 
age i am going to i am going to ask a very very interesting career progression i know pretty much yeah. about you uh, very very early age of introduction into the banking sector so thank you so much mr navi and uh, mr navi is actually uh, is 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 fondly called navi first of all for the viewers his name is mr navi jay shankar uh, from karnataka and uh, he is very fondly called navi by the associates and uh, his students and uh, the fraternity of uh, internet and cyber uh, cyber law he is a chairman of uh, foundation of data protection professionals in india which is called fdppi and he is also founder and director of cyber law college and you can visit navi.org to know more about him in fact uh, uh, navi is like uh, wikipedia of uh, indian cyber laws as i understand and he is also the managing director of uh, Ujwala Consultants Private Limited. Mr. Navi has uh, several of uh, the domain services br branched off into, let's say, Navi.org, Ujwala.com, uh, FDPPI.in, CEAC.in, CyberLawCollege.in. Goes on like that. And uh, thank you, Mr. Navi. Like you know, what happened uh, in 1996, 95, 96, as you beautifully recalled. Uh, those days, people used to buy desktop computer for home, and a laptop came much later. But what happened? Um, you were one of the uh, few people those days who wanted to buy not desktop computer for home, but you wanted to buy home PC. So there is a lot of difference between home PC and desktop at home. And you have spent more than a lakh and forty thousand rupees in 1995, 96 to buy compact home PC. and i proudly say i i uh, i was conduit to supply that product to your home so that's a beautiful recall you had thank you very much for that uh, sir i would like to um, uh, get into my segment 1 uh, session sir i like to uh, understand uh, also viewers to know about the career progression starting from your personal journey um, your educational background your school days your uh, you know um, uh, native place your family members and how did you really get into your first a uh, banking uh, industry you were the um, you were at the age of 20 when you joined i guess indian overseas bank as a professional you obviously very early age so would you be able to share those memories yeah see early part of my career if you take up to the graduation and the post graduation if you take education is actually always the first uh, foundation for whatever else happens uh, later on so uh, the post graduation was uh, msc in physics but to reach msc in physics um, went through the various other uh, schooling uh, at the part of my career i was moving with my father who was in state government service as an engineer so we went to lot of uh, smaller towns like taluk headquarters okay um, life in a small town is much different from life in a big city as you can uh, know um one thing is uh, that we were uh, not having many friends because uh, uh, the officials friends were one category uh, okay um, in fact i remember that i was working in madur uh, madur is a place uh, in between <coughs> in the school the activities of the school involved uh, maintenance of uh, the school's uh, garden uh, uh, space where we were uh, uh, taught how to plant uh, uh, rice plants and other things uh, which is actually very much relevant to the village uh, students uh, but we were also uh, doing that but physically we were not as strong as them and uh, we were asked to actually carry water pots from the nearby nala to the place and do it and uh, i was one of the weakest persons perhaps in the group both because age wise in every uh, stage of my, my educational career i was one of the younger persons in the uh, group uh, and i used to actually take the help of uh, other people in the physical activities though in academic activities i was always in the uh, forefront in fact that was the time when education system was a little uh, you can say flexible if there is a very bright student he would be asked to move to the next class uh, half way down okay so that was how 
I had half of third standard. Then I was asked to sit in fourth standard. Okay. Uh, so I saved one year of my education there. Then uh, so and subsequently PUC one year uh, PUC was there. That was the reason why by the time I was um, 19 years, I was having the post graduation in physics, which is not possible today. Uh, okay. So on the 20th birthday, I joined the um, career. Okay. That would not be possible in today's context. But that is one of the aspects. And uh, just to briefly say that after uh, going to a couple of these uh, smaller towns, by the time I came to high school, um, our family settled in Mysore. My father was still traveling, uh, but he felt that uh, for educational purpose, it is better that we stay in uh, Mysore. So my high school education was in Mysore city in a school called Mahajana High School. That was the time when I was introduced to the English medium. In fact, you know, transformation from the local medium to English medium was, is always a very big transformation. So first year of uh, uh, the school went in uh, adjusting to the city of first year. Again, um, it so happened that after the first year, I was moved to another section which was supposed to have uh, more greater students. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, probably I had made my mark in the other group. So that actually meant that I came across uh, people with uh, very, very, I mean, uh, uh, bright future. Today, if I look back on uh, uh, them, uh, there are people who have uh, uh, gone through various, uh, I, if you look at it as an alumni kind of a thing, there are people in that group who are abroad, who have served the government in uh, one of the persons who are in Pokhan, uh, 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 group that is uh, the group which was responsible for the atomic uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, testing in which uh, he was the person who actually managed the whole uh, uh, security aspects. We had another person who went to USA and had research uh, this thing. So this is the kind of people who I came across uh, during my high school uh, uh, days. Following that, of course, um, I went into BSc, uh, which was a science uh, background. Then at the end of BSc, I had a turning point in my career. Uh, this age actually became a sort of a problem there. Because to join engineering, I was two years underage. Okay. So after I completed my PUC, despite my uh, marks being good enough, I was not able to join uh, engineering. I was told either you wait for two years or pass BSc for three years, then come back and join for the second year BE. Okay, so that was how I missed my career in engineering. Uh, okay, today if we look back, many of my people have uh, uh, done engineering or something like that. Today, uh, BSc is not the career that people uh, would look at. But I was forced into it because of my age consideration. Then after I completed BSc, somehow uh, I thought of going further uh, into the pure science. I did my MSc in physics. Uh, I enjoyed that. In fact, there is no doubt that I, I enjoyed uh, that physics. Um, and uh, when doing physics, the normal mindset is who, what will happen to an MSc physics person? He will become a lecturer. Okay, so. Uh, teaching was uh, almost a career which was considered part of studying of MSc. Um, so that was how teaching uh, became a, uh, perhaps an early I mean, uh, career uh, option for uh, me. Uh, subsequently, today, if you look back, that is a passion for me. Teaching is a passion and uh, I'm enjoying my career because it involves uh, uh, teaching. And behind this is that uh, MSc um, in uh, physics. But my teaching also has evolved. I can uh, maybe in the next uh, summer uh, I will explain how I transformed myself as a teacher uh, of today from the day when I first had a lecture uh, in my MSc as a student's uh, you know, presentation. Sometimes one presentation has to be made in the year. So whatever I did then and whatever I'm 
doing today, how the transformation as a teacher happened is very important because uh, many times professionals are good professionals but not good teachers. Okay, that is something which I would like to share with uh, you. Yes. Okay. Very nice, very nice. That's a beautiful journey. And I also know that by going through your profile, I understood, uh, which I didn't know earlier, that you were so interested to learn uh, psychology, the human yeah. behavior and psychology. That led you to uh, explore mul you know, multiple avenues uh, as you went forward. So we will get into that. And uh, uh, with that, I'd like to ask you the another um, question is about your uh, entry into the bank. Because you were a banker for a long time. Because you entered in the age of 20, December 27, 1973, 1973, I guess you have joined Indian Overseas Bank, yeah. Professionary Officer. Would you be able to share those experiences yeah. briefly? As I told you, when I did my MSc, I had, of course, an uh, interest in pure science. I would have gone into research in the area of physics. People would have considered it as a natural uh, progression. Um, but um, for some reasons, um, uh, though I was eligible and I was very much uh, interested in taking up a research scholarship in Mysore University at that time. And I was the most eligible person because I was the number one rank holder uh, in, the, in my batch at that time. But somehow, because of the politics involved at that time, um, which was basically caste-based politics at that time, I was told my professor, uh, if you put in your application, then I will have to select you. But I have given word to somebody else. Kindly withdraw your application. Uh, that actually hurt me a lot. Okay. And um, I, of course, uh, could not continue there because the same professor has to be my guide. If he is not willing to take me, there is no way of going uh, forward. So I withdrew my uh, application. Then I had an excellent opportunity which came up in Physical Research Laboratory in Ahmedabad, PRL. Uh, okay, PRL uh, actually today was the organization from which the first Indian satellite work and other things were uh, done. And um, I was the only person selected in my entire uh, batch in that PRL interview. So it was a big uh, yes. uh, on quantum physics. Now, quantum physics has now come to help me now. But at that time, I remember the parity breaker in that interview was that interviewers were always asking one question about, a, about quantum physics. Everybody had uh, failed to do um, and answer it correctly. There were people from all over India, um, rank holders from IIT and other things. Somehow when I stood there, when the same question was asked to me, I didn't know the answer earlier, but I gave an answer which was the most correct answer. It just sparked, it came as a spark. And that was the reason by, by, for which they were very much interested in getting me. But uh, so happened that during the time I was in Ahmedabad at that time, the weather there was so harsh that actually I was uh, having a sunstroke kind of a thing. Yeah. And that actually made me feel that <laughs> Ahmedabad is not the right place uh, kind of a thing. So you can say that see, in life, several things affect our uh, career. So I left that uh, scientific uh, this thing. Then the question was, I had two options. One was to go for management IIM. Uh, other was to go for uh, a, a job straight away. Uh, because uh, banking job at the time was uh, considered to be very uh, lucrative, uh, a comparable teaching uh, uh, job. I had uh, the IIM Ahmedabad application with me. If I had made an application, I would have definitely got into it because at that time the competition was not like this. There was no CAT or something like that. Uh, based on your university examination, you would get it. And my marks list was quite good from SLC, PUC, very, very uh, good. But the day I decided that today is the day I will wait for Indian Overseas Bank uh, order. Otherwise, I will go for uh, IAM. Uh, I came back. I remember I used to ride a a scooter called Wiki. Uh, okay, Wiki scooter. That was what my father had bought me when I was in first uh, yeah, MSc. So I was returning. I still have that visualization of uh, coming back home, thinking that uh, it was around the afternoon, two o'clock or something like that. Maybe I would have gone to morning show <laughs> film or something like that. Uh, I was thinking that uh, today is the day. I will send I am 
application if i don't have iob uh, order by the time i landed up uh, home i had the order from indian overseas bank uh, so then uh, i thought that is my destiny and <laughs> and um, i served faithfully indian overseas bank uh, as if it is my bank and uh, even today i look at it though also after some time i felt the need to change that was different but i am always grateful to indian overseas bank for having been the first uh, organization which actually gave me the job and uh, from the education shifted me to the job uh, kind of an environment correct in yeah. fact uh, i could also see from your profile that uh, you know uh, you also grew in the ladder of uh, iob and uh, you became a branch manager and things like that uh, are you i think you went to bombay and then you worked for a few years in bombay as well if i'm right and then you moved into a, a corporate life of coming out of a bank government sector to a corporate life so i like to i like to ask you a few questions about your journey from iob to i would say i am moving on to the segment 2 now right now in the segment 2 the first question is all about from iob to fdppi yeah it's a huge journey it's a huge journey it's about 30 plus years of journey so would you be able to share your um, rk swami bbdos experience to cyber law college to fdppi at this point in time yeah See, because i was academically bright even today i reflect back on that day <clears throat> i remember in one of the examination questions in physics i reproduced uh, certain figures you know nuclear physics lot of uh, figures have to be uh, we call it as energy levels okay uh, i reproduced a particular uh, chart which may have had 30 different uh, figures uh, with decimal points uh, running to fifth or sixth place kind of a thing i had a fantastic memory at that time i don't have it now but at that time so academically i was always bright so when i joined i would be i immediately pass all over all examination i knew that i didn't know anything about banking i became an officer but uh, the first time i went into the bank was for taking a draft for uh, the joining uh, uh, whatever deposit they wanted security deposit so my father used to be a person who would do everything himself so he will not allow us to do anything uh, of banking and other things so but i took it up as a challenge that uh, if i am an officer in the bank i should know everything about the bank so immediately i concentrated on the banking examinations for caab Uh, without difficulty i passed through that that was where accounting and other things were first time introduced but i came on top of for most of it there was no uh, issue uh, so because of that i was put in an accelerated career in our uh, bank uh, okay whoever had passed caab first attempt was supposed to uh, have an accelerated uh, path and um, i was a very very hard worker there is no doubt about it in fact uh, when i was in iwb i was always doing two persons work uh, at a single time and uh, when i was in bombay where uh, i used to work in a branch called new marine lines i remember that uh, other people were keeping things pending and as a probation officer i would be asked to clear that uh, uh, work and uh, uh, what was required to be done in four days i used to simultaneously do i used to have two ledgers on left two ledgers on the right two ledgers on my Uh, table top and post multitasking. post uh, multitasking multitasking manually i used to do and um, i used to do it happily because i didn't have anything else but i am sure that the accountant or somebody would have felt so happy that i am relieving him of all the <laughs> botheration um so i was a hard worker uh, that was recognized by one uh, manager uh, in uh, bang uh, mysore called obaidullah khan okay um he was a manager of a particular branch and i was deputed as a, an accountant there for some 20 days uh, you know when somebody goes on leave i was a person who was not married young and uh, i was a deputation person i was placed in yadavgiri but uh, i was sent to 20 other branches all over the karnataka whenever some manager goes on leave i used to go there um, both villages as well as branches once i went to this kermola branch where this obaidullah khan was the uh, manager he was used to an accountant uh, who was perhaps not as hard working as uh, me so manager used to do a lot of work when i went i had this uh, kind of a uh, this thing that i will not let anything go past my table 
<laughs> okay. So unless I am told don't do this, I will do it whether it is uh, the superior person's job as I because you know bank officer has got all the powers. Uh, okay. So there is no difference between an accountant and a manager in terms of powers kind of a thing. Mm. I immediately took charge of the situation in such a manner that this manager was very very happy. <clears throat> he was so happy that uh, he put in uh, the word with the regional manager uh, and that was how two years after I was, uh, I, the first two years was probation when I went to Vijayawada and uh, other places and then came back as a confirmed officer to Yadavgiri and two years only I worked there, one and a half years, okay. At that time I was recommended to be the manager of a branch in Karnataka yet to be opened which was a huge uh, responsibility, okay. Uh, so that was how I was elevated to the branch manager's uh, position. It was one of the most enjoyable periods for me because it was a rural town. In fact, I keep telling people that one of the photos which I enjoy most is a photograph in front of the bank where there are a number of characters around me. And who are those characters? They are all, uh, uh, say, buffaloes and uh, uh, cows which have been financed by me, <laughs> by the bank. Okay. So this, uh, at that time, there was this Anand Mill scheme, okay, you know, Anand Mill scheme and Karnataka had adopted a uh, representative of that and it used to provide this finance uh, for milk revolution, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, financing for milk, uh, cows and buffaloes was one of the activities which I was involved in and oh. uh, that's why I say when, whenever people purchase uh, that, they used to bring it to the bank, show it to me because I have to see that buffalo. <laughs> In a way, my progression in career, which is reflective of whether I was a banker, a non-banker or something like that, also progressed with the uh, type of work. My movement from this uh, uh, bank to the rest also was influenced by the fact that after I completed my CAAB and also a certificate in industrial finance, I picked up the management diploma. It's called an All India Management uh, Diploma. Uh, that was the only thing which was possible for me. I had left the IAM option earlier. Now I had to do something on correspondence. And a recognized correspondence course in management at that time was only AIMA DM, a Diploma in Management from All India Management Association. I took it up. Okay. While studying that, marketing was one of the subjects which became very, uh, I mean, uh, you can say uh, passionately important for me because that involved this consumer behavior research kind of a thing. So this my interest in psychology converted into consumer behavior research and marketing that tied up and I was uh, very uh, much interested in marketing. The second thing which All India Management Diploma did was it introduced me to the computers. How say as a person in uh, MSc Physics, I studied the branch of nuclear science uh, where some electronics was there. Out of the several uh, branches of physics which were there at that time, ours was the only branch in which computers was also part of the study. Electronics was part of the one paper was there on electronics and uh, there was this quantum physics, both of which are relevant in uh, uh, today. But this All India Management uh, dip I mean, uh, Diploma I took up a project work. The project work was study of management information systems in NTC group in Chennai, in Coimbatore. I was in Coimbatore at that time as a faculty in charge. So management information system, there I ended up my uh, uh, report by suggesting that NTC should use computers for this managing management information system. So that is how use of computers for managerial decision making came to my mind and uh, computers became a part of my uh, subsequent uh, activity. Earlier to that, my interest in computer was as a mathematically interested person. So when I was in Indian Overseas Bank, I had bought one Casio uh, scientific calculator with programming calculator, which was which could take basic programming. I used to use that basic programming to create uh, deposit interest charts in banks. So okay. whenever interest rate changes, now a whole lot of interest charts used to be prepared 
before my head office could do that i was sitting in the zonal office in bombay i would release my uh, interest charts okay because i had programmed my this thing okay so that was also the time when banks were thinking of uh, 1980s uh, first balanced computerization um, so there was something which i did there but this management uh, information system that gave me a fundamental reason to study the use of computers for business and uh, that was how marketing and computers both became a matter of uh, interest for me because i did imrdm okay mm -hmm. and then in the bank i was in my last career heading what was called merchant banking division in uh, the delhi zonal office uh, i have to mention one thing here which also is a reflection of how i have actually grabbed opportunities which came to my mind when i went to bombay i went there as a person with a specialization in credits i was put in the zonal office as a person in charge of uh, credits i was doing that but uh, we had a merchant banking division in uh, chennai but most of the business used to come from bombay so new issues public issues used to come from bombay there was one person who was actually uh, acting as a pr coordinator for madras but uh, when i Uh, came there i started introducing several concepts of marketing in the zonal office uh, marketing of deposits having a new year resolution campaign something like that i used to i produced a lot of brochures in fact before i joined rk swamis i had my first brochure designs creative work done in indian overseas bank on recurring deposit marketing uh, annuity deposit marketing and schemes which no other bank had but i had coined it as a combination of multiple approved schemes okay some of those schemes city bank later on uh, used it but uh, historically i can say i was the first person to have introduced that uh, scheme uh, as a combination schemes in indian overseas bank because i had no authority to introduce a scheme and promote it as a, a scheme so since i was working on marketing somewhere uh, one conference came and i was told that because i was a senior person say by being a probation officer what happened was i suddenly became senior you you, you can imagine when we went to the branch you know senior is on the basis of the date of appointment as an officer branch has got a number of clerical staff um, who are having a lot of experience and some of them have become manager i mean officers i still remember one mr ashok who was my first day teacher in uh, Uh, Indian Overseas Bank. He's in Mysore right now. Mm -hmm. See, when I reached the uh, last few uh, years of my career in Indian Overseas Bank, I was holding the Merchant Banking Division, so uh, in charge. So from there, um, the option in the bank was to move out to a branch again as a routine bank uh, manager or officer. I felt that that was a little uh, functionally going down. Uh, and being a merchant banker, head of projects, talking to managing directors of companies, kind of a thing, coming down again was not very palatable. So I decided that I should move out. Okay, so that was the time I moved out from the banking to actually Nagarjuna Group, which was a finance company, where I was there for about three years. And um, fr from Nagarjuna company. i had an opportunity in uh, for nagarjuna group company i was doing merchant banking i mean uh, financing activities high purchase related activities export import related activities then this opportunity came in a company called akya swami bbdo advertising <clears throat> because i had handled merchant banking i was dealing with uh, the advertisers for much i mean uh, public issues RK Swami BBDO was a product advertising company. They did not have any business in financial advertising. So therefore, I actually went to them to set up a division called Finhance, that is financial services division for promoting financial products. So if there is a bank which has to be marketed, uh, banking services have to be marketed. Uh, the uh, mutual fund has to be marketed like unit trust. Public issue has to be marketed. They all involved financial products. The traditional advertising company people did not know much about uh, the um, uh, financial um, product marketing. So I became a domain expert and I joined them and I headed their finance uh, division. 
uh, we got business uh, of advertising associated with public issues, which was a big component. Of course, creative work was uh, good for me and whenever an opportunity came for uh, any Kannada related uh, uh, copywriting, I used to be the person who used to do copywriting. So I got myself uh, involved into the traditional uh, marketing and advertising activities. Spent uh, 11 years in the advertising company, not uh, one or two years. Okay. That's when, that's when I met you, sir. Uh, yeah. So it was a fairly long uh, stint. I was very much impressed with that big man, R.K. Swami, actually, uh, who also had branched out from uh, being uh, an executive in a multinational Hindustan Thompson and uh, set up his own advertising company. He was an entrepreneur at that time. And he had that um, mindset for indigenous uh, development kind of a thing. So he felt R.K. Swami advertising was uh, supposed to be the organization which uh, will develop more of uh, advertising as an Indian organization because maybe at that time, uh, uh, I don't know what was the time period, uh, it, must be, I, it must be somewhere in the 1940s or something like that. Maybe there were a few advertising agencies from abroad, so Akya Swamis was an important development for the advertising industry. So he was a very impressive person in terms of uh, the thought process. He always used to say that uh, if you are in an organization, as long as the organization grows, you will grow. He used to give an uh, example that if there is a lotus flower in a pond, the flower rises when the pond water rises. So as an employee, uh, to work for the organization's uh, uh, benefit. And uh, R.K. Swamis had adopted this Hansa as their brand, which is uh, supposed to be the mythical bird, which is capable of separating milk from water. So these are the two concepts which uh, he had very strong uh, faith in and uh, I also appreciated that and uh, there was a lot of freedom for me in Arke Swami the video uh, to develop and uh, I flourished to there otherwise for a banker to be an advertising person is not easy. See as a banker when I was sitting in the chair of a merchant banking people used to come to me okay but uh, as an advertising person you have to make calls. Okay, but <laughs> it's in it's in your control. Law of your control. Control of, uh, role. Psychologically, you need to adjust. In fact, this is one of the things which I tell many people that when you shift from a public sector to private sector, be prepared for this change. You will not have the same kind of respect you had when you were a public sector uh, person. Okay, uh, now you have to change that attitude and uh, be subservient to the situation. Though you may know lot. Say, you, you will definitely know a lot. A uh, banker knows quite a lot because of the experience of others. We learn from others. No? If, if I finance 10 projects, I have in, uh, I mean, knowledge about all those 10 projects. But at the same time, when I go to a client uh, uh, as an advertising person, I, it is totally a reversal. So this mindset change was required. I think I was able to do that. Otherwise, I would not have uh, been there for 11 uh, long years. So say today, um, it's a decade now. 13 years I was in IOB, 3 years in uh, mm. Nagarjuna, and 11 more years in uh, Akeswamis. But mm. I, in Akeswamis also I moved up. Uh, See, so whatever designations were there, they gave uh, regional manager, director, uh, uh, everything uh, they gave. But finally, mm. in the 1990s, internet came. Mm. <clears throat> okay. Now, at that time, I used to write a regular column in newspapers on investments. I was known as an investment writer. I had taken it over from a very reputed uh, columnist in Indian Express, uh, okay. the weekly column. Uh, so I was reasonably known for that. So somebody introduced to me saying mm -hmm. that in America, a new revolution has taken place. Newspaper is coming home through computers, they said. That was the description of internet. Say internet coming home. Initially, you know, internet was used for news uh, more than anything else. Then they said, since you are a writer, why don't you write articles for the internet? That was the first time they had given me some printouts of US articles and other things, and I first learned what was internet. Okay. Then um, I paid five thousand rupees to VSNL for attending one of their training programs, one day training program, just to know what is internet. Okay. Then. Um, 
there was a company called uh, today you have heard of click info uh, yeah. okay click info in its early stages uh, one mr badri sheshadri was uh, managing that now espn has taken over that they were giving uh, uh, one hour uh, access to internet in their premises okay so vsnl training they have given me one hour chip i came and uh, sat there to visit various websites okay then i thought that there is a technology involved here there is a marketing involved here okay now in the advertising agency there is a newspaper advertising specialist there are people who are specialists in uh, tv advertising okay but internet advertising is a zero day game at that time nobody knows about internet i should be the person who should occupy that slot it was actually a marketing thought process okay that is occupy you know in philips quarter he always says that when uh, you put he quotes a particular instance where somebody went to an african country to study the shoe market one person said nobody wears shoes here so there is no market and another person yeah. said nobody wears shoes here so there is tremendous market so that yeah. way uh, i saw perception it's about perception it's about the perception so i thought uh, in advertising agencies I have had people with 50 years experience in print advertising, another 30 years experience in TV advertising. I can never be the number one in that advertising field. So I was in banking, which was 100 year old industry. But internet industry was one I could be the zero day specialist. Okay, that was how I moved onto internet as a media. Internet as a media for creating website. At that first time, it was only creating websites. Uh, like corporate brochure, uh, then other uh, things. So I took up that uh, exercise. We designed the first website of Corporation Bank at that time, uh, and Corporation Bank was to go for uh, public issue at that time. We hosted a serially numbered application form for download in the website. It was something which was uh, unique at that time, innovative at that time. Today it is uh, very simple uh, things. Secondly. When Sundaram Finance came up with a, a, a website requirement, we created a website and placed a high purchase online calculator on their website, where you can calculate okay. the EMI. Okay. By the customers. Directly. Customers. Somebody can go there and calculate. So the programmer who was doing it didn't know much about what is EMI and what is uh, high purchase, when you change the interest, or how will the EMI changes. I sat with him and said, this is the first step. You take this A, you take B, multiply that, square, whatever is the thing. And he created the program. So first online high purchase calculator, at least to my mind in India, was placed there. Similarly, in Corporation Bank, we placed the recurring deposit calculator there. So if you put 100, 100 rupees for 24 months, what will be the value at a given interest? So they were unique in their own way. Where we integrated the brochure type of websites into a more interactive website giving certain benefits to the uh, uh, user. So uh, we designed uh, websites for a number of companies in uh, Chennai, uh, uh, banks as well as uh, finance companies. Um, so that was one, of, one phase of my internet activity. <clears throat> Then a situation came that I wanted more specialization there. Then 1998, uh, the government uh, released the first draft of cyber laws. Uh, then I said that uh, I'm already a zero day expert in internet, but now I have to be a zero day expert in uh, cyber laws. Okay. So I guess, uh, I, I guess during this period, you wrote a book called Cyber Law for Every Netizen. Yes. Right, there's a book released in 1999, if I my recall is correct. So 1998, first draft came. 1999, the government actually presented the bill to the government uh, to the parliament. The day the bill was presented in the parliament, my book was released in Chennai uh, by the uh, for the general public. The idea at that time, I had a false impression that uh, parliamentarians will read this book before they pass the law. Okay, <laughs> which was not correct, but I thought that uh, it's a complicated law. People have to understand technology to pass this law. I was happy with the law because the law, draft law had been placed in the internet. I had created my website, uh, my first uh, navi.com website was devoted to 
section by section uh, placement of uh, what was called e-commerce act at that time uh, and i had invited public to comment and that comment was given to the government etc <clears throat> I mean, you are talking about e-commerce in the year 1999. Yeah, yeah. 1999. That is a yeah. Today we are talking about e-commerce big scale. It was 1999. So in fact, <laughs> many times when I discuss with people today, I sometimes feel embarrassed that I did it in that year. I did it in that year. You know, if you say uh, alternative dispute resolution, I say in 2005 I created arbitration.in. Okay. If you talk of uh, banking. I in uh, so so and so year I was the first person in India to do this. I have been a first person in many of these things. You know, now you are talking of cyber evidence archival center. You mentioned that. That has been one of the first things uh, which I did in India. So there are several first first things, probably because rest of the world wanted to be only followers. See, whenever something new comes, there are only a few people like us who will who will have the courage to take it up and take it further. Whereas many other people, uh, even in Indian Overseas Bank, one of the things which I didn't like is whenever a new idea is given, they say, what has State Bank of India has done? If State Bank of India does it, then we will do. So I told you some of the deposit schemes which I had uh, drafted um, were actually first time in the industry. If you had given it to Reserve Bank of India, they would have agreed uh, for that. But I was again a follower, not a leader. State Bank of India was uh, the banking uh, leader. Yeah, that's why Citibank took some of my ideas, not my ideas, they might have got it independently, but still they became uh, implemented in another organization. So same way here, 1998 when this law came, I said the government is asking public to comment before the law is passed, and it's our responsibility to give our recommendations, therefore I created my website, which was earlier First version of my Navi.com website, now I am running it on Navi.org, Navi.com has been spotted by somebody else. First version was, I am, my name is Vijay Shankar, I studied in uh, Mysore, my embassy, that, that kind of personal information uh, was the first website. But when this uh, e-commerce act came, I put section by section uh, information there, collected public this thing, and that was how my name was known in the Ministry of Information Technology. And I was also asked to be an advisor in a couple of groups at that time because all over India there were only a handful of people. One Mr. Paul Dugal in uh, Delhi and uh, another person uh, uh, in uh, uh, Pune and myself. We were the only three people who were actually uh, trying to understand in, uh, information technology act from the beginning. In fact, in the, when I wrote my book, at that time, I had already started a uh, negotiation uh, with an international digital certificate company for a tie-up with an Indian company. At that time, so, in digital uh, signature and other things was a completely new uh, thought process. I was into business negotiation and had almost finalized that. And in the last minute, of course, uh, some other bigger company in North India took over that project and denied it uh, to the Madras uh, company. Uh, so I was far ahead of the time. In fact, if I look back on my career, one of the problems I've had is every time my idea is 10 years hence, at that point of time, uh, commercial exploitation uh, was difficult. So my idea is good as a research person. I know that it will happen, okay, but commercially people fail to invest because they felt that it is too early uh, kind of a thing. So 1998 when the act was passed, uh, when draft was there, I had my discussions ready. 1999 when the bill was about to be released, I had my book ready. Then 2000 when the act was finally passed, the same month I launched my cyber law college as an online educational uh, institution. I mean, you started an online uh, training program for cyber loss way back in 2000. 2000. Okay. 20 years ago. <laughs> at, that, at that time, I had to take that because of cost consideration. Okay. Of course, I had uh, once uh, wanted to start up uh, a training center physically. Then I thought that if I start managing a physical center, I will be like uh, a manager of a coaching center. I cannot become a global uh, teacher. So I dropped that project and then went into this online version. At that time, uh, people didn't have respect for online. 
Okay. In fact, uh, I remember one person, one lady walked into my house and asked my wife, where is Cyber Law College? <laughs> okay. She came to my residence and said, where is Cyber Law College? I want to admit my son. Uh, okay. Because this concept of virtual uh, was so alien to uh, the people. Today, of course, uh, it has become so common. In fact, the, the colleges are now coming to the virtual field. See? Absolutely. Absolutely. Hi, here, I would like to um, uh, pinpoint here. I mean, uh, it's a very profound because you, you, today we are talking about online learning for school children, first standard, second standard, third standard students on a smartphone at home. And even six months back, people used to laugh when we say we can learn through uh, internet. But you started this virtual cyber law college in the year 2000. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to... I'm trying to understand you, the mental agony you would have undergone when you wanted to teach people, tell people that's going to be the way forward. It's not way forward for a few years later. 20 years have passed. Yeah, yeah. You know, 20 years back when you launched, how was your mood, sir? How was your mindset when uh, people uh, did not appreciate it? Uh, no, I told you, I was into it because it was a necessity. I could not set up a uh, uh, full-fledged college. In fact, I had at that time discussed with the Madras uh, university for uh, association okay because cyber law of course nobody else in india was doing i was the person who was uh, doing the, the other person in uh, Pune called Robert Nakpal was uh, trying to do so we two were having the educational uh, activities uh, this uh, pawan dugal was into actual practice okay so there were only two people in india and uh, i had negotiated i wanted to negotiate with the madras university that we will have an association i will do everything but the certificate can be issued by the university. But their enrollment system, if you look at their form, the first question was how many acres of land you have, how many buildings you have, who are in the governing council. So these are the criteria for approval. So I, I could not satisfy any of those things. Uh, so I dropped that and I said, I will give my uh, program. Whoever wants to take it, let them take it. I'm not charging them a bomb. Uh, I'm charging them even at that time some 3,000 rupees, uh, 2,500 rupees, uh, some uh, even less uh, charge at that time. I said, whoever wants to take it as a professional improvement, let them take it. And initially, I used to do it as a distance learning uh, kind of a mode that registration, everything has to happen online. I used to send them books, uh, uh, this thing. I also used to send them email. But since everybody was not comfortable with reading the long material uh, in the form of uh, uh, emails, I also has, had to send uh, the physical uh, books. So a combination of distance learning and online marketing uh, uh, was the kind of activity which was there. Uh, I used to conduct some programs online. For example, a Baroda College wants to conduct a program for the, the people then uh, using online methodology. There, one computer will be there. I will be speaking from here. Some such online uh, video versions were also uh, uh, used. But uh, they were all done, but nobody else, as you said, um, respected uh, that. In fact, as far as this uh, you know, small uh, paper students are concerned, about eight, 10 years back, I formulated a big project called Cyber Vidya, presented it to the Karnataka government and said that we should run this online platform of education up to 10th standard, which is available for open pooling. Okay. In Karnataka, up to 10th standard, you don't have to, you can take the examination directly. I said, we will create a platform in which the best teachers from the state will speak on individual lessons, lesson one, two, three, four, in lesson, uh, thing, lesson like that. And we'll have three or four people, depending upon the accent, somebody from Mysore, somebody from Hubri will speak differently. So we need some different accents. So each topic uh, lesson will be handled by the best teachers in the state. And that will be made available. Schools which do not have uh, adequate teachers, which is a problem at that time, even now, we, the government schools don't have proper teachers. I said that you have only a mentor who will sit in the class and show this particular video. The best teacher in the state is teaching a Kannada lesson one or a mathematics lesson five. Then what more the students want and whatever they don't understand, the teacher as a mentor will explain that. It's a, it's a, it's a level playing field for all yes. children across the all state. All these things. Okay. 
and then i had also told that then we can integrate similarly for higher education for example in engineering a yeah, first semester student in bangalore can interact with a first semester student in delhi they will become a batch of like minded so the cyber vidya was a project which wanted to do this initially for only lesson delivery subsequently for even evaluation i said this examination system also should change see we can evaluate a person as he is going through the lessons like this different levels in games no uh, uh, so a person when he is solving a particular exercise how quickly he solves other things can be recorded and therefore at the year end you don't need an examination how he has taken the lessons during the years can be used as an evaluation also so the cyber vidya was conceived as this multiple stage project i proposed it uh, for uh, a test to this thing but somehow funding did not come from the government i think cyber vidya the cyber vidya framework which you created for karnataka government i think this is the right time for many institutions today suffer uh, because of the covid scenario they are trying to adapt to the new technology new world but they are actually miserably failed because they know where to start how to progress all the time they are offline uh, physical yes. uh, experience yeah. they have yeah colleges universities today they want a professional consultant a professional to support them give them guidance give them advice i guess uh, uh, cyber vidya yeah. is a uh, yeah. if c j anand does some project like that i can be a consultant for uh, uh, okay. all right I, sir i take this opportunity to uh, tell the viewers uh, educators and institutional uh, academicians colleges schools correspondent principals please connect with mr oh. navi because uh, he is already having the framework for 20 years uh, he will be the better asset for you to take the knowledge take the concept take the framework and then you can start implementing in your own way yeah. so this is an appeal to all the viewers here yeah go ahead sir so like that several things i can say was the first i was the first not to boast for example this online dispute resolution mechanism today i have got this uh, program called something called odr global dot in 2005 i said this is the way we have to go and i developed a model for e courts at that time and we presented it to the technical committee in uh, delhi also today at that time it was rejected so nobody thought that we can have a now suppose i and you are talking over here if it is a e court there will be a third person sitting here fourth person sitting here we can still have a e court that is the system which i have framed in this uh, odr global dot in for online mediation and arbitration it is within the current legal provisions of uh, india better than what uh, the current e court system has been envisaged and it is in tune with what united nations is trying to bring in called ancestral model for uh, adr odr okay so that i introduced in 2005 very few people took uh, notice of the potential available there similarly cbse is something which i have been telling that there is something called section 65b in indian evidence act every document which is presented to the court as an electronic document has to be certified cbse is a platform for that so cbse and odr global was actually considered as global e-commerce or it enabled services in fact i wanted to promote them as the uh, entrepreneurial uh, projects when i decided to leave arkeswamis okay because arkeswamis was financially i was quite well off okay um, and from there to give up that this thing and become an entrepreneur was uh, not an easy decision in terms of the financial uh, burden i was uh, taking but i had a faith that these products cac and uh, odr uh, products along with the education product of cyber law college and the information dissemination product called the portal called navi.org they can together be a bundle of e opportunities which could be exploited commercially okay but out of this only cyberlawcollege.com took off because people understood that somewhere i was able to get candidates for this now we got org was envisaged as an information dissemination this thing only free this thing the other two cyber evidence archival center i'm continuing to uh, uh, generate some revenue on a basis that is a uh, uh, litigation support uh, system but not in an automated scale 
I envisage that to be a global platform with uh, people from across the globe using CEAC. Now I have got a concept called CEAC Dropbox in my website. That is the concept which can be universally adopted. I wanted it to be the e-commerce project. It did not happen. OER Global also did not take off. Uh, basically because those products were ahead of time. Now Man. others are coming in. Um, they want to do that on their own. Let them do it. Uh, they will uh, learn uh, it hard way. That I, will, I, would like, I would like to dive deep into these areas uh, in my segment three, which is about empowering society, where yeah. you can also where you can also inspire more aspiring entrepreneurs who can take up those services and generate revenue for themselves. It is kind of a collaborative economy. So yeah. here uh, in the segment two, I have few uh, rapid fire sort of questions, sir. Sir, now uh, you have uh, started from early years of life in the internet. Uh, I mean, your experience is as equal to the age of internet in India. So in the world, in fact, I would say. Um, uh, you have actually scaled up your domain knowledge and your professional support even to the government of India and the state governments on various aspects. For example, GDPR is quite popular in the European Union. And then here in India, I think you have, uh, you know, you created this FDPPI and the personal data protection, the data protection, the, the importance of data. Today, every business organization, entrepreneurs know pretty well, data is everything. Um, the business analytics or data science is growing like mad exponentially. But on the contrary, they don't look at one thing, which is about the, the challenges the possible challenges which this segment is going to undergo down the line if they don't protect the data properly. So would you be able to share more trust on this say, FDPPI and data protection and personal data protection? Yeah. See, having uh, addressed the issue of uh, cyber law, training police for cyber crime management, and then also undertaking certain, uh, you can say, um, initial uh, uh, litigation support to some of the clients. This Personal Data Protection Act, which is expected to be a, a law very soon, I have identified as the, the biggest development in this IT uh, legislation area since IDA 2000, that is Information Technology Act 2000, from 2000 to now 2020, this is the most important legislative development. <clears throat> so what Information Technology Act said was information has to be used by the organizations in a particular manner. If they are, if not, that will be considered as a cyber crime. You may be punished. You may have to pay uh, damages. That was the perspective of the cyber crime law called Information Technology Act. Now, within that act, somewhere in the year 2008 and subsequently rules framed in 2011, Government realized that out of all the data, there is one segment called personal data. That is data of individuals like name, address, uh, uh, mobile number, etc. And India supports something called privacy as a constitutional right. And it has to be protected. This is a globally recognized uh, democratic right. India also said in 2008, we will do that by introducing uh, something called reasonable security practices, which should be followed by all IT organizations and something called due diligence. The objective of due diligence and reasonable security was to ensure that personal data is protected. This is there in Information Technology Act. However, Information Technology Act continued to be looked up more as a cyber crime law, not as a data protection law. So people were ignoring that. Okay. Now, this Personal Data Protection Act, after GDPR came in the European uh, atmosphere, and it, they said GDPR is also applicable for uh, companies who are not in EU, so it is applicable to Indian data processors. The awareness of data protection regulation became high because GDPR talked of a penalty of 2% of the global turnover or 4% of the global turnover of a particular organization. There have been instances of $100 million fine, etc. You know, under GDPR. So the Indian industry woke up 
to think that there is a GDPR, we have to be compliant with uh, that. In India, this Aadhaar discussions were going on. Supreme Court was pressurizing the government that you should protect the privacy of the persons even while you use Aadhaar. So the government of India constituted a committee and then in the year 2018, one draft bill was presented in the parliament, which was revised. And in 2019, one bill called PDPB 2019 has been presented in the parliament. Just as I did in 1999, took up the um, awareness creation for Information Technology Act when it was at the bill level. Since GDPR, about one year before GDPR came, GDPR came in 2018, somewhere in, the, in May, uh, somewhere in January 2018 and earlier, I started talking about GDPR is coming, Indians are going to be affected, we should do this, we should do that. Then 2018, this uh, first draft came, then I started talking about India is coming up with this law, this is what is going to change the uh, industry. 2019, we have come closer and now we have come even closer because Joint Parliamentary Committee has already been in the process of finalizing it. And this act is going to apply to all SMEs and MSMEs which are your close associates as I understand. Because as of now, almost all organizations in India, whether it is government or private, whether it is a school, whether it is a charitable institution, whether it is an association like FDPPI, all of them protect personal data of individuals who, which come to their possession, either because they are members. If I am a school, I have got thousand school children and their parents' data for last 10 years. Huge database, a temple, trust, everybody, they have to follow this law. And this law says, don't wait for a crime to happen to go to a police or somebody to ask for compensation. There is going to be a regulator and I will be watching you. What proactive compliance steps you take for preventing a data breach. Okay. okay. If I say that you have to appoint a data protection officer, if you don't appoint, I will put you a fine for that. If I say you have to make an uh, audit, to find out whether there is risk or not, you have not done that, you have casually started some business. Even if nothing has happened, I will put you a fine for that. So, for non it's a, it's a prevention model. Yeah, it's a prevention model for non compliance of what is required to be done to prevent a future problem. The, there is a regulator who will be watching and he may impose heavy penalties. If, of course, data breach actually happens, then the other law also will kick in. So if a personal data theft happens, like in the case of phishing and other things, both data protection law as well as the ITA law will apply. Data protection law will ask what precautions you had, what security you had, and other things. If it is inadequate, I will put you some 5 crores, 10 crores fine. Then the IT Act, police will also take their, this thing. So this is a new development which cannot be ignored. There is, you can't wait for something to happen and nothing has happened, I'm happy. No. Even if nothing is happening, you have to take some steps. Now, what is that step you have to take? You have to read Personal Data Protection Act, etc. So, in 2019, when this bill was presented, I was telling people that it is time to look at what is there in this law, which will become a law after two years. Hmm. But be ready. Hmm. So what I did was in January this year, 2020, I produced a book on the Personal Data Protection Act of India, PDPA 2020, and released it in print model. Okay. Now, many people ask me, it has not become an act. Why are you writing the book? You are trying to make money out of a uh, law which is not in existence. Can you call it as a Personal Data Protection Act uh, when it is still a bill? I said, all that, I don't know. Okay, I want people to know that there is going to be an act and I want them to be ready with the provision so that I don't want law to come from tomorrow and everybody is scrambling at that time, uh, what is that I have to do or something like that. This is not good for management. So I said I will start doing this. Then in December, January this year, under FDP, FDPPI was started in September 2018. Two years, that is uh, May 2018, GDPR came. September, we set up in India this foundation of data protection professionals because I envisage data protection 
uh, ecosystem needs an organization like that. There is no such organization in India at this point of time. It is an organization which is built from bottoms up from the FTPP, the uh, data protection professionals. And okay. we, start, we started looking at certification. There are two projects in FTPPI, the third project mm -hmm. on uh, state, which I'm very fond of. It goes with all the things I have stood for in the last 20 years. I want in India, data protection area to be self-reliant. Okay. Okay. So, Mr. Narendra Modi has called it as Atmanirbhar and I am something which is doing that for the rest, uh, last several years. I have seen that Indian industry is spending money for acquiring certifications like ISO certification that this kind of a thing which certifies that you are compliant with a particular law. Then Indian professionals are taking up various certifications of international organizations paying 50,000, 60,000, 1 lakh of rupees to be called a certified ABCD. Okay. Correct. Now, I am thinking that if India is going to come up with a law which is similar to GDPR and Indian professionals require a certification which is uh, recognizing their skills, I will create it in India and let okay. India, my money remain in India. We will have a certification body. So, FDPPI started certified data protection professionals as a certification okay? uh, in different modules so like uh, indian law uh, no global law then we will be having uh, on data audits technology and behavioral science that is if there is a person called data protection officer in an organization what are the behavioral skills he has to develop that also is going to be part of our certification program so i want to ensure that indian companies invest mm -hmm. less and acquire the expertise, not spend one lakh of rupees to get a certification from a foreign organization, which itself does not teach Indian law. It teaches GDPR and tells a person sitting in Chennai, I, play, I am certifying you as an expert in data protection. He cannot be a data protection expert because he doesn't know Indian law. Okay, so I am creating a specialization in Indian right. law. And if Indian person has to know about GDPR because his organization is also exposed to that, I am giving that input here. So our certification is entirely Indian oriented, comes at a, about one fifth of the cost of the international uh, state because this compliance has to be there for big and small people. Okay, so which means that if anybody who cannot invest one lakh of rupees cannot say that I will not be able to get qualified. So I want to bring down the cost. That is what we have done. Correct. Secondly, these certifications yeah. like ISO 27701, yeah. which cost not five lakhs for any organization, I think no SME is going to take that. They will all say it is good. Let Infosys take it, let Wipro take it. We will not be able to take it. We will try to do whatever is possible. If possible, I will take a pirated copy of ISO and try to put it, but not <laughs> Uh, implemented okay so i felt that even for that just to place it on record the quality council of india no qci they are pretty strong into you know navigate and then uh, remove all the pirated people who do all the yeah. practices on the isos they are very strict today yeah. government of india that is fine okay now so the only opportunity for uh, these smes is i have to invest at five lakhs or something like that or remain non-compliant at least on certification platform. They can still be compliant, but not certified. I am saying that we need, we have a responsibility as professionals in India to provide an affordable option to the SMEs to be compliant with global laws, but not at the cost of what is being done at one the cost of uh, that. Inclusive, inclusive growth for professionals, by professionals in India. And I want this, this uh, framework, we have called it as Personal Data Protection Standard of India, PDPSI. And I want to actually make it an open standard because not this copyrighted, uh, this thing where uh, I have to uh, pay some hundred dollars to know what is the standard. You see, a uh, current uh, anomaly in the market is if somebody says you have to be compliant with the law, then you ask me, then tell me what I have to be compliant with. I say, I, you pay me hundred dollars to tell you what you have to be compliant with. So that is the current situation where copyright is being used for protecting the uh, ISO standards. 
I am saying standards should be free. Implement it when you call, you charge. If you want an expert and let him charge a bomb if, you, if his capability is there. But to know what is to be complied with, why should I pay money? This is my uh, viewpoint. The basic, the basic awareness must be there, correct? The basic awareness should be there. So I am planning to have this PDPSI basic standard as an open standard. But there will be some, each uh, implementer can have some detailed documents. That detailed documents is a is something which the consultants develop, they may charge for uh, that separately. Who can uh, take up this course like uh, anybody and everybody? Uh, basically, now we are talking of professionals who have an understanding of uh, the data. So anybody can take. I am not going to say that you should have an LLB degree, you should have an engineering degree kind of thing. If you are a practitioner of data protection, you can take this PDPA uh, course. Now, we will try to give you as much training as possible. When the act becomes operative, the data protection authority may have their own evaluation examination and certify somebody as a data auditor. Like in the patent office today, if you want to become a patent consultant, you have to pass an examination. Now, that kind of examinations can be implemented by the government on a later stage. But we are introducing from the private sector certain um, uh, examinations and certifications. Hopefully, people who have passed these certifications should be able to pass whatever government tomorrow says uh, as a particular thing. So that will be the only qualification, if at all, any regulatory body puts in. So today we are saying that if you are a professional in the information technology area, interested in data protection, you can take that. See, this first module of Indian laws is relevant to even entrepreneurs. Say, if you are a CEO of a company, and this law is coming up, whether you should invest in a, appointing a person as a DPO or not, you should know. So this first module of certified data protection professional module for Indian laws is relevant for every CEO, IT professional, everybody. Now, if you want to you, Typically CTOs. Yeah, so the CTO. a basic competition course. Then subsequently you take Specialization, no about GDPR, no about CCPR, that is option open to some uh, people. That is how we have created a layered uh, training uh, program. These two together, if it is fully used by Indian entrepreneurs, there could be a foreign exchange saving running to lakhs of crores of rupees. Okay, okay. It is also going to save the country. We are going to come to the country, national yeah. building. A huge national building exercise. Yes. And of course, we are, we have to wait for the, of, uh, the DPA, the Data Protection Authority to come, recognize us. Money. Okay. <clears throat> okay, you are you are organizing this FDPPI also have to get certified, right? Some sort of recognition is required from the government of India that you uh, can do this. We are a section eight company, that is to say not for profit company. Uh, okay. Okay. With these certain objectives which we have uh, uh, provided. Now, when the Data Protection Authority is set up in India, if they say that uh, certifications uh, uh, conducted by some XYZ is accredited, then we will have to go and approach them, please accredit us, uh, kind of a thing. This is what we have done for the last two years. We have created hundreds of professionals. Before even the Data Protection Authority has come into India, we will make our pitch at uh, that time. But in the meantime, we feel that we need to give this service of education across the board, particularly to who cannot afford the other available uh, um, frameworks and ensure that before Data Protection Authority comes, we want India to be fully ready for implementation of data protection. True. Okay. True. When is it? When is it expected to get rolled out, sir? This Data Protection we, Act. When is it get, uh, you know, passed? We are expecting that in this current monsoon and this next session of the parliament, uh, are failing which before December it will definitely be passed. The bill has already got to joint okay. parliamentary committee. Joint parliamentary committee has held several uh, meetings. We also have presented our this thing. We were also invited to present our views. We have presented and they are in the final stages up to the September 15th is the date they have given for collating all the uh, information. 
So from September 15th, if they take another 15 days uh, for uh, finalizing that, uh, before the end of this current session, um, they should be ready to present the final version of the bill to the parliament. Then, of course, parliament uh, Great. Uh, discuss and pass it. Uh, and one more thing for SMEs, uh, Anand, uh, because uh, uh, you are uh, associated with SMEs. Close on the heels of this Data Protection Act, government is talking of another legislation called Non-Personal Data uh, Governance Act. See, Personal Data Act is for protecting the personal data because that is a privacy related issue. So it will say, don't do this, don't do this. If you do this, I will give you so much of fine, etc. Right? In a way, it is looking at the ne preventing the negative side of uh, the uh, misuse of a particular uh, personal data. But government is coming up with another uh, regulation which is on the positive side. That is, what you can do with personal non-personal data, how you can unlock the value in that non-personal data. See, today you have got a data out of which you pull okay. out the personal data subjected to all restrictions which this act uh, says. Then what remains is non-personal data. Now, as a company, you want to realize value out of it. Correct. Now, that is what this data scientists do. Big data people will do. Now, the government is coming up with a regulation to ensure that this non-personal data becomes available as a raw material for innovative small small companies today this personal data gets okay. concentrated only by googles and facebook or some big audiences i and you cannot get the access to this data for any innovative project what government may do is that out right. of this non-personal data certain data which the government itself develops through its resources that will be called as government data okay then private companies will be given an option like a stock exchange we will create an exchange you can sell your non-personal data through the exchange let others bid and take it if there are some very critical data which is of national security importance government may say that you have to hand it over to the government so all combinations are there but small and innovative companies can have access to non-personal data for the purpose of commercial use which is a different approach than this data protection law protection law is to prevent uh, use in a particular manner this non-protected uh, personal data is to see how it can be used so that is a very innovative uh, way the government is thinking of expanding the data market and its exploitation and i want these SMEs to be ready for this. It may take another two years for this law to come. But unless you are ready to handle this personal data protection act today, you will not be ready to deal with the non-personal data tomorrow. I think uh, uh, this is the right time for uh, SMEs, MSMEs, entrepreneurs and institutions, education institutions, B schools, uh, general public to at least learn what is going on learn what is the it you know the um, the data protection act which is going to be passed in the parliament of india so uh, i think this awareness is first importance and the second is i also find that the data is going to be money yeah. finally the data is going to be money data is going to be the wealth so how we look at that is what is going to make a lot of difference in our lives down the line so thank you very much for this segment two closing um, i would like to quickly go for the rapid fire question on the segment three and then we will end up with segment four. So yeah. we have another 10 minutes to go. Oh. So the segment three is uh, about uh, uh, the uh, society, giving back to society. Of course, uh, you have been giving back to society in terms of creating awareness about the cyber security, cyber law, and the IT Act 2000 onwards, and today data protection. So the evolution of yourself as an individual as a personality, as a professional, I think you grow along with the industry standards, industry, uh, you know, the evolution in, in, in terms of internet and cyber loss. So the question is, three questions to you, sir. One is, in brief manner, you can share as a bullet point. What is that youth of today have to pick up in terms of 
understanding about this data protection or cyber law uh, in total so first message for youth yeah the so first thing is we should respect a law which is coming up for compliance we should not say how i can bypass this law because many of the technology people who are having that ethical hacker mindset or hacker mindset so they want to call, call it as ethical but a hacker mindset only to say are they say to uh, app is there how i can break out of this so that should not be the attitude if you find some vulnerability in an aroge setu app try to help the government to improve the security so respect the law not try to uh, find bypassing of the law even with non personal data protection if you see the biggest of the technology experts are saying you bring the law but uh, you say something is anonymized there is no way you can anonymize there is a artificial intelligence i will find out what is personal data you can find out okay but that should not be the attitude of the technology people we have to respect comply with it it will become yeah. so that is why it will become cpi one of the objectives is to create ethical data protection professionals i have added the word ethical there because i don't want simply data protection professionals who are expert hackers okay i because if they don't have the interest of the nation in mind i don't want them to be called as uh, respectable uh, professionals so is so a most of the criminals are experts of some kind there is no doubt about it okay particularly in the it area all hackers are good enough to be security officers in an organization but they have look that making a fast buck is it not so we not yeah the current Correct. youth Marvitt, should Marvitt. look at this if you want i can give an example of this sometime back i warned one a uh, person who was a senior person in uh, sifi uh, satyam computers when he found out a script to break into irtc uh, uh, ctc uh, app of registration of uh, the this thing he, he actually gave it free on his website said so that anybody can use this app you can bypass the irctc security and book the ticket tak call bookings you can do whenever you want but i told him that you are breaking the government a security system which is like hacking into the government system fortunately he withdrew that script this happened about 8 10 years back subsequently other criminals came with a similar app that is uh, different but as a responsible corporate person this person realized that what he was doing was a mistake that is what others can do okay good the second is um, what is a message for uh, uh, business owners entrepreneurs yeah so now we are talking of a data protection law which incentivizes the compliance but actually by nature we should be compliant okay so business owners should look at taking compliance as a business cost and try to manage uh, it rather than trying to do something and uh, address the breach when it happens because sometimes you may you it may happen you may do it or like when you cross a red line in a light if no police is watching you can car cross but you never know there may be a cctv and tomorrow you may get a notice so likewise it is possible that entrepreneurs and business owners may be re- re- neglecting the legal compliance requirements today because either the government is not watching or government doesn't have the capacity to call everybody and book everybody but we never know that it may happen today or tomorrow i don't want to be one of the persons to be punished even though 99 other people are not punished i cannot go to the court and say you are not punished all the people why only me okay so Correct. i don't want to so, take the risk so the third question is uh, for the parents and general public a typical parents who have children who uses smartphones but there is a void between the parents and children because they are not digitally strong and these people are only digital natives <laughs> and general public yeah. so what message for them i know it, it is def- definitely a, a problem uh, because the parents don't know whether uh, their children are doing things correctly or not as in many children who are experts already in hacking okay because some uh, tool is available somewhere i don't know where they pick up uh, from their friends or circles they pick up these uh, hacking uh, tools and they are able to do certain things which we as law law complaints people say it is a crime 
okay um, but it happens and we have also seen addiction apart from the crimes we have also seen addiction this pubg was one of the things which we actually said uh, sometime back it should be banned it has happened now because of this chinese uh, this thing so the parents are unable to decide whether that war is subject to a addiction problem uh, like uh, this blue whale program you know that the people yeah. uh, kill themselves kind of thing or they are using the resources for uh, some criminal activities by just downloading uh, some pirated software that is one of the things when they bring pirated software they, uh, they may get viruses and all those uh, issues so parents have to be made little aware of this okay that is the responsibility of the schools so when you have a parent student meeting which you used to have earlier even now if you want you can have it virtually one of the things is that in the, in the current scenario when we are expecting the children to use more and more of online versions we are telling parents please buy a, a tablet uh, for your child or something like that we are indirectly encouraging that no school should uh, uh, promote this without also promoting the safety features okay so awareness should not be a requirement at all it should be a uh, inbuilt thing for every use of this now beyond awareness it is an attitude of the parents my son uh, is very intelligent i can't tell him something and if i tell him something he will uh, perhaps uh, uh, be angry with me if he is angry that may be because he is already addicted or he is already doing a wrong thing so the parents should also be psychologically built up to address this small 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 issues but i don't want parents to be psychological experts counselors should be there in educational institutions and they should perhaps mandatorily have discussions with the children at various points of time and ensure that they are free from addiction free from this um, uh, tendency to deviate uh, the and try to do whatever is possible to make uh, parents aware but parents cannot be psychological experts so we should remember that we should only make them observers let the parents observe and then uh, inform the counselors counselors can take the uh, action so schools responsibility is very high in this in fact i have said that uh, they are more responsible they should be more responsible than parents because in certain aspects children listen to the, their teacher more than their uh, parents particularly if the children feel that my, my mother doesn't know anything about uh, computers and how will he listen to anything okay but he will not have the same attitude to the um, teacher so teachers have to take that responsibility schools have to take that responsibility the schools and colleges and education institution take responsibility and educate people children parents should cooperate oh. parents resist because of the ignorance is what you are trying to convey that's fantastic sir now we have moved into the the last segment uh, the fourth segment i have few minutes to ask you a few questions um uh, so uh, deep you have involved in sharing about cyber law and cyber security information act and uh, the data protection act personal data protection all that beautifully explained now it's a kind of a, a little relaxing moment for you uh to just to ask you like uh, looking back and going forward in a very very brief way so when you look back uh, your last uh, 20 years of uh, cyber law onwards not the banking side from cyber law till today so i'm looking at from uh, cyber law internet uh, technology perspective as a entrepreneur yourself as a professional you would have dealt so many um, uh, challenges which even government would have approached you a uh, cyber law uh, police department would have approached you certain cases you would have handled you don't have to share the private things but some nostalgic uh, maybe it could be sweet memory or maybe a learning experience would you be able to share the learning is there throughout say one of the reasons why i have reached what i have reached today in terms of knowledge not necessarily a successful in terms of money and other things i am not much bothered about it but i have at each stage i have not forgotten what i have learned and try to use that as a stepping stone for something else so um, and i have not been stagnant also so one of the reasons is that i have been looking at new things and i am able to 
clear adapt to that to the extent that i was involved in the first um, let us say the conviction which happened in india uh, under cyber crime okay you can call it as an achievement the first civil uh, i mean uh, case in which a bank was asked to pay damages to a person that was also handled by uh, me these are achievements which became uh, today some of them are actually in the textbooks uh, for colleges and uh, are examination questions oh, okay uh, how that particular so that is uh, uh, good but there have also been instances when i have solved a particular case and felt bad about it the one such case was in uh, chennai when uh, a person sent an email to some of the government secretaries saying that bombs will be blasted in several tasmak shops between such and such a date and such and such a date this was actually eight, 10 10 years back so it was a bomb threat but that person actually was unhappy that the government was selling liquor through tasmak shops that was his uh, internal uh, urge but he sent this so we uh, within uh, 24 hours, this person was traced and next day morning when he came to the office, uh, police were already there to catch him. Uh, end of the day, Sun TV, when I was watching, this person uh, with this towel on his face was going and beside him was his poor father. I felt very bad that day. Uh, that feeling has not left me even uh, today because that father said, Guni, that uh, his son, who was perhaps employed and other things, uh, has become this state. Uh, so I was uh, thinking that I was <laughs> instrumental in that person being uh, held. That was one of the uh, things. But uh, ultimately, when we see some people will have to suffer because other people have to, let's uh, say. Correct. Okay. Correct. Because, you know, the father has uh, no clue of what has happened, but yeah. because of son's, uh, yeah. you know, so, attitude this man got exposed to the media and the media also should be little subtle to handle these things to protect the, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, because of that See, uh, um, we have actually come to the end of our uh, wonderful conversation i'm extremely happy because the flow was something great one thing what i found in your conversation with you is um see you have been in the industry as a banker you started your life grew and then completely branched off into corporate life, which is advertising industry, RK Swami, BBD, for 11 years you served. Then branched off into cyber law as a completely a new field ahead of time. Even today, it is ahead of time when you talk about personal data protection to the marketplace. Even though we are a new normal, adaptability quotient, COVID, virtual, e-learning, LMS, everything we talk as a jargon, at least people started realizing that we need to get into this. But you started implementing those things as part of your ecosystem way back about 20 years ago 15 years ago that is something very awesome i think some people leave a legacy behind their life uh you know like dr apj abdul kalam he said 2020 india should become superpower we are already in 2020 but it's not that you know uh, it is there in everybody's heart whether we made it today or not we are actually work in progress actually we are all proceeding the nation is building so like that, I could I see you as a visionary. I see you as a person who's ahead of time to warn people, to caution society, the civil society, a general public. And that is really a great, uh, uh, you know, the benchmark you have established in the industry. Because I, from a distance, I see you uh, last 25 years or so. You grew stature to stature. Uh, you, you, you were not the same. You are not the same Mr. Navi of what I saw in 1996 on cyber law. Today, you moved into something special, something bigger. My associates, my colleagues who are very closely associated with you, like Mr. Sridhar, he used to tell me a lot. In fact, he recently completed his your data protection course. He was so happy that, you know, I got certified now. So that gives, you know, a lot of confidence to the society, to the entrepreneurs. I'm sure people who are watching this uh, uh, interview, long interview, I'm sure you would have got inspired um, in the last 35, 40 years of his uh, experience journey. Uh, he has really served our nation. He's been serving our nation in true sense, not just in the commercial aspect. Uh, it is beyond commercial, beyond monetary aspect. Uh, we should actually uh, 
uh, talk to Mr. Navi. I mean, you can talk to Mr. Navi. He's a very simple and uh, uh, approachable person. Uh, you can log into his websites. I will share all the description of his company's uh, contact details, credentials in the YouTube description page. You can connect with him directly. You can have a word with him. Take his advice. Especially, I would recommend institutions, uh, correspondent, chairman, and uh, college principal, um, school authorities, educators, academia. Please connect with Mr. Navi for uh, you know streamlining your new normal approach on e-learning e uh, aspects. Of course, uh, professionals, SMEs and MSMEs, CTOs and uh, IT uh, experts, you can connect with them for data protection, certification and learning and uh, the further course of action. So with that, I would like to uh, say my heartfelt thanks and uh, gratitude to Mr. Navi. Sir, do you have any final word about our conversation? Oh, yeah. You are talking about me, but I see that you also have grown in stature over the period of time which we first uh, uh, met. And uh, in a way, that shows that uh, you also found new grounds and your uh, colleagues uh, uh, also have helped you. And as a sea change uh, consulting also, you have, you have done a lot of things. And today, if you are sitting here and if I am told that uh, this is a series of meetings you are having with a number of uh, such uh, people, creating uh, videos which are inspirational, that itself is a big contribution you are making to the society. I am sure that uh, people who are watching this would like to know who are all the other people with whom you have interviewed earlier. So they will perhaps subscribe to this channel and perhaps uh, uh, keep track of whatever has already happened and also what may happen uh, in future. And uh, I appreciate that you have also taken this as a sort of a, uh, um, I mean, opportunity to bring uh, such uh, people who are otherwise they may be good in their own area, they are doing something on their own area, but you are bringing them into your platform and sharing that with uh, others, which is itself a big service. And uh, you, you are also uh, providing uh, consultancy services to SMEs and others, which I understand you are doing. You are in a position to not only create awareness of opportunities through these uh, videos, but also perhaps uh, get together people and uh, even translate this awareness into practices. I'm sure you are doing a human job and it will be appreciated by all your persons who are already members of your uh, community or maybe through watching this kind of programs, they uh, realize the importance of that. So I must thank you for uh, giving me an opportunity to express uh, myself and look back on my past 20, 25, 30 years of uh, <laughs> life. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, and my heartfelt thanks to your nice words of encouragement. And I look forward to meet up with you for uh, more and more such videos and discussions. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. All for working out. Thanks to all of them. Yeah.